Welcome to the League of Women Voters of Janesville and Beloit's annual Forward Together celebration. My name is Linda Reinhardt, and I'm honored to be the president of the League of Women Voters of Janesville. This is the second year that we've needed to hold our event virtually instead of being able to hold our usual luncheon. We hope that uh, for next year's Forward Together event, we'll be able to share a meal and socialize together in one room. First, a few housekeeping details. This event is being conducted on Zoom video conferencing. This event is being recorded for later viewing. To keep background noise to a minimum, we have muted everyone in our audience as they have entered our meeting. We ask that you please keep yourself on mute unless you are invited to speak. In a few moments, we will ask the audience members who hold or are running for public office to introduce themselves. At that time, we will ask them to unmute themselves until they have been introduced. If you have any questions for our speakers during our meeting, we ask that you type your questions using the chat feature that you can click on at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to write questions as you think of them. We have League members who are monitoring your questions and comments. They will direct the questions to our speakers in the Q&A session that we will have at the end of the event. This mid-February event began several years ago as a celebration of women and was held on or near the birthday of pioneer suffragist Susan B. Anthony. Coincidentally, the League of Women Voters was founded on February 15th, 1920, excuse me, February 14th, 1920. So in 2020, the year that marked the centennial of the League of Women Voters and the final ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that gave women the uh, right to vote, uh, the, uh, the leagues, our leagues, decided to reorient our focus and make this event more of a celebration and a rededication to the mission of the League of Women Voters, empowering voters, defending democracy. And mindful of our two leagues and Wisconsin state motto, Forward, we renamed this event our annual Forward Together celebration. In 2020, our keynote speaker was Megan Wolf, the executive director of the Wisconsin Elections Commission, who told us why the upcoming 2020 elections in Wisconsin would be secure. Last year, our keynoter, UW political science professor David Cannon, told us why we should have confidence in the results of the 2020 election, yet face a challenge in restoring trust in the integrity of our elections. This year, we are looking ahead to the 2022 elections and beyond by focusing on the challenge of encouraging young people to engage in our democratic system of government and make becoming a voter part of their identity as they move into adulthood. This annual event has been a fundraiser for each of our leagues, and we hope that you will remember us and consider making a donation to the leagues. Uh, the funds raised from this event will be shared equally by the two leagues and will help us continue our work. Susan Adams will tell you a little bit more about the Leagues of Women Voters and the work that we do. Susan? Susan, you are still muted. Okay, now, there we go. I'm Susan Adams and I'm the president of the, of the League of Women Voters of Beloit. On behalf of the Janesville and the Beloit Leagues, we thank you for your attendance today here at our LWV Forward Together celebration. Well, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization. It was established in 1920 and then advocates for informed and active participation in government. Our members are women and men who work to improve our systems of government and impact public policies through education and advocacy. The League helps citizens register to vote, hosts candidate forums, <clears throat> and studies local, state, and national issues, and brings informative programs to citizens in our areas. The League neither supports nor opposes candidates for office at any level of government. At the end of today's celebration, we're going to give you information about candidate forums and other events that the Beloit and Janesville Leagues will be holding in, in the spring. 
and we hope that what you will hear from our speakers today will inspire you to support the league's efforts, attend other league events, and even inspire you to join us and actively engage in our efforts as a member or one of our community partners. So I wanna thank the members of the committee who put this together and maybe we, there's so many of us, maybe you could just wave your hands. Um, I, I helped and Betsy Brewer, Mary Bulo, Lisa Johnson, Heidi Keith, Deb Colsty, Janet Labrie, Laura Peterson, Barb Porter, Linda Reinhardt, and Sue Scott. And they could just wave real quick and then we could see who they all are. Thank you very much. We wouldn't have been able to do it without all of, all of us working on it. Now we're fortunate enough to have several, quite a few actually, elected officials and candidates for office and attendance. I have a list of those who I believe are present. If you are an office holder or a candidate, please unmute yourself now and then go back to mute after you've been introduced. I'm gonna call your name so you can be recognized. And then I'll just say your name and then you will please just identify yourself again and the office that you're seeking. And that's all we have time for. And um, anyway, I will introduce you in alphabetical order. So I know most of you know what that would be. So you know when your name comes up. Okay, Stephanie A. Gartner. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephanie Egeter. I'm finishing out a term as a county board supervisor for District 25. Thank you much. Brian Anderson. Good morning, uh, Brian Anderson running for the, the seat on the school board for the school district of Beloit. Thank you. Carla Buchanan. She, she may not be here, Carla Buchanan. Okay, Aaron Burdick. This is Aaron Burdick and I'm running for Janesville City Council April 5th election. Great, thank you. Tori Champany. Hi, good morning. I'm Tori Champion and I am running for Beloit School Board. Okay, Sue Conley. Good morning, everyone. Sue Conley. I am your Assembly State Representative for District 40, which is basically Janesville. Thank you. Alan Furness. Good morning, Alan Furness, running for Rock County Board, District 21. Okay, Dave Homan. I thought I saw him. Dave Homan. Look at the chat. He has a message in the chat. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, I'll go on then. Susan Johnson. Yes, hi, Susan Johnson here. I'm finishing out a term on the Janesville City Council. Matt McIntyre. All right, James Millard. Hi, my name is Jim Millard, and I am uh, incumbent running for the Janesville School Board. Okay, uh, Megan Miller Later for tomorrow's. Hi, oh, hi. Good morning. My name is Megan Miller. I am the current board president of the Beloit Board of Education, and I am running for a second term. Okay, Kathy um, Myers. Hi, I'm Kathy Myers, and I am the current president of the uh, School Board of Janesville, and I'm running for re-election. Great, Christine Raleigh. Good morning. My name is Christine Raleigh and I'm running for the Board of Education in Beloit. Thank you. Ann Rowe. Good morning. My name is Ann Rowe and I am running for the first congressional district seat, um, challenging Brian's style. Okay, thank you. Uh, Greg Schneider. Hi, I am uh, Greg Schneider, um, running uh, treasurer for the uh, school board of Beloit and running for another term. Okay, Allison Semro. Good morning, Allison Semro. I am a three month incumbent of the Beloit School Board and I'm running for re-election. Okay, Mark Spreitzer. Good morning, I'm Mark Spreitzer. I'm state representative for the 45th Assembly District. Okay, Lisa Tollefson. I am Lisa Tollefson, I'm your county clerk. Okay, thank you. Um, there might be some other people that I missed, and is if there is, would you please unmute or say something? Yep. So this is Ryan McKillops. I'm a uh, school board candidate, uh, City of Beloit. Thank you. 
Anyone else? In the chat, Dave Holman says that he cannot use a camera and his microphone on his computer doesn't work. And he says he's running for the Rock County Board of Supervisor District 8. Thank you very much, Nancy. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, well, let's give a round of applause for all the people for all their hard work. It takes a lot of effort to run, even if you don't get it, and to become, become an official. So thank you, thank you for all your hard work. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan, and all of you who hold or seek public office. Uh, democracy cannot work if there are not people willing to run for elected office. We thank the incumbents and challengers for their willingness to put themselves forward through the rigors of campaigning for and then serving in public office. Our government cannot function effectively without the talents and efforts of persons willing to work for us in federal, state, and local government agencies. We want to be certain to express special appreciation to County Clerk Lisa Tollison and all the municipal clerks and other election officials in our area who work so hard to make our elections fair and secure. As I indicated earlier, our Beloit and Janesville leagues made a decision two years ago uh, to have our annual event focus more on the future. Uh, there is no topic that looks to the future more than to consider the voters of the future. And that is why we selected Growing Future Voters as the theme of this year's event. Growing Future Voters is a concept you'll learn a lot about today from our keynote speaker, Kelly Beadle. But before we get to our keynote speaker, we'd like you to meet online some young people of Rock County who are concerned about voting. And I'll turn to Janet Labrie to introduce this segment of our program. Janet? Hi. Um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce the contribution of Tony Capizzoli, a teacher at the business department at Beloit Memorial High School. He was, he's also the organizer of Good Trouble. Um, a group of young adults who want to leave their part of the world better. <clears throat> and Tony has produced for the League of Women Voters uh, several video interviews of young adults who each explain what voting means to them. And are you seeing Tony there, Linda? Okay. Well, um, so back to Linda then for the videos. Hi, um, my name is Nathan Sill, and the first time that I voted was in the 2020 election. Voting is important because it's enacting the change that you want to see, not only in your community, but also the larger world. It's important to surround yourself with people that are well-educated and knowledgeable in different areas and fields to give yourself a bigger picture of the landscape that we live in. Not to get lost in all the opinions to do your own research and to do fact checking so that you can create your own individual voice. Going out and voting is especially important for younger people because it's seeing what you want represented and being part of that process. And with such diversity in the younger generation, we need to help encourage each other to go out and speak on what we believe in so that we can be part of the change. Hi, my name is Yasin Camacho. Currently, I am a sophomore in college, and I remember the first time I first voted. I remember how proud of myself I felt. It was during a primary election, just like the one we have coming up, and I felt so happy when I left the voting booth because I remember thinking, this vote isn't just for me. I didn't just vote myself. I voted for other people who don't have that privilege, who aren't able to cast their own vote, who don't have that voice. I was giving a voice to someone else, and that's why I feel like voting is so important because we have to remember that we aren't just voting for, for ourselves, we're voting for other people that aren't able to. And I feel like a lot of young adults like myself tend to, tend to forget that, that, that that's why voting is important. And that voting is what paves the way for our futures when, we're, when we aren't in our 20s anymore, when we're older, like 60s or 70s, the consequences of what we vote for right now are gonna catch up to us then. And that's why I feel like what we do right now is important for our future 
and why we should continue to vote and why voting is so important. Hey everybody, on behalf of the League of Women Voters, I'd like to take some time to remind you about the importance of voting. Even though times now can seem overwhelming and uh, even unchangeable sometimes, voting is an easy way to put some effort into making sure that your interests are represented in local government. Um, so I urge you, take some time, you know, research the candidates, figure out whose views align the best with yours, uh, make sure you're registered, and cast that ballot because voting and making sure you're voting in favor of your interests and your community's interests is really going to be the way that we fix a lot of the problems that we have now. So make sure, you know, you take that time, especially in primaries where these races really do affect your direct community. You know, presidentials are important too, but now we're voting for things like school board and city council and county board and things like that. And those are the things that are going to affect your day-to-day -day life. So please vote. Uh, I would appreciate it, and thank you. Hi, it's Deanna from the Beloit League of Women Voters here to remind you about the importance of voting. Exercising your right to vote is one of the easiest ways to voice your opinion on issues that are affecting our community. Our local government should represent and reflect the community that it serves. It is our responsibility to make our voices heard and to have the issues that are important to us take center stage. Our vote today is the foundation of a brighter tomorrow. It is the duty of all the citizens of this great nation to exercise their right to vote. Hi. Matt McIntyre speaking. I'm running for the Rock County Board Supervisor seat, District Number 3. It covers basically the city of Edgerton and a little outlying area of Fulton Township. I'm running to do good things for the city of Edgerton and for the county as a whole, when it comes to public works, making sure our roads and streets are in good condition. I work with uh, Rock County Economic Development Coordinator, coordinator to make sure that uh, uh, be involved with the job creation and bringing jobs into the uh, cities in Rock County and Rock County as a whole. And Thank you, Matt. Um, we we are mo moved on to a new section right now. Oh. Oh, I. That's okay. I, That's okay. Will, will you contact me in a little bit so I can speak? No, no. no happy. That's, go ahead. That's allowing us uh, campaign speeches. This is just an opportunity for people to introduce themselves. So thank you. Oh, for, sorry. For doing that. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, but we we've passed that section of the uh, of the program. Thank you for coming and and uh, participating. Will you contact me uh, still for a little bit? Can I stay online? No, we can stay online. But um, please mute yourself. Okay, how, how do I speak? You have spoken. So oh. thank you very much. Okay, um, and I want to thank Tony Capuziello and the students, Nathan, Yossi, Yuval, and Deanna for giving us such thoughtful words and sharing them with us uh, through your videos. One of the students, uh, Deanna Renteria, is with us here today. So Deanna, uh, uh, we know that uh, you are a student at UW-Whitewater and have recently transitioned to the, uh, from the Rock County campus to the main campus in Whitewater. Last fall, you invited the League to meet with you and student government leaders at UROC uh, to talk about how we and the student leaders might work together to get young people more engaged in civic life and become registered voters. How and when did you first get interested in becoming a voter yourself? Hi, Linda. Thank you for having me. Um, I think that public um, discord has always been something of interest to me, um, even at a young age, but I never really knew how to get started. And when I went to college, I joined a political group and that kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things that were going on at the time. Um, the primaries were coming up and it just so happened that one of our former members was run, running for um, a district supervisor seat. And we thought it would be a good idea to show our support and canvas for him. And I remember 
that being such a positive experience, um, not only speaking with him, but the residents of that area, I remember him being uh, so passionate about serving the community that he grew up in. And I remember thinking, wow, I, I would like to be someone like him, someone so passionate or work alongside um, someone like him. And so, uh, yeah, the 2020 primary was the first election that I voted in. And I, I helped um, other people my age to register to vote and finding their uh, poll location. And I remember um, getting this, the sense that they felt empowered by, by doing this. And I think that's what it's all about, um, that feeling of empowerment, like you are contributing to something bigger than yourself. Well, thank you, Deanna. Why do you think it is important that you vote? Do you think your vote makes a difference? Well, um, I grew up in Beloit. Um, I've lived in Beloit my whole life, and I've seen the city uh, go through a lot of changes, and I just want the best outcome for people in Beloit, and I want people that um, that understand Beloit to serve on our school boards and on our uh, city council positions. And, of course, I think that uh, it is important to vote and that my vote matters. Um, it sounds a little cliche, but one one vote can can make the difference. Okay, well, you're a member of the League of Women Voters of Beloit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what led you to decide to join us, and how has becoming a member of the league been of value to you? Well, in in 2020 during the centennial, I was invited as a guest by my history professor, Dr. Jaswak. Um, and I remember sitting in the audience and feeling this call to action. Like this was some, this was a way that I could become more active in, in my community and become a small voice in my community. And I think that I have been, um, like I said, I've, I've helped people register to vote and I've gotten the sense that um, this is something that they always wanted to do, but they just weren't um, sure on how to get started. And I think that's common for a lot of young people. They think that it's something that's more complicated than it really is. And, and they're embarrassed perhaps to, to reach out or they don't know where to reach out. But um, after registering, like I said, I remember them feeling so empowered, like, wow, like, I can't believe this is the first time I voted. And I, I believe that they will continue to vote in in the upcoming elections. Yeah, makes sense. What made you get comfortable enough to encourage others to become voters? Kind of what you've just said, I think, but is there anything more you wanna add about being comfortable about getting, being able to vote? Or being able to vote? I, I just feel like I was so fortunate to have people that helped me get started and I just want to be that voice for somebody else. Okay. Thank you very much. We appreciate all the work that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. Deanna, I believe that you've been active not only in student government at, in college, but you've also been an active member of the Latinos Unidos on campus. Are you particularly interested in engaging Latinx students and other persons of color in the political process? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm interested in getting as many eligible voters to the polls as possible. And certainly with Beloit having such a high um, Latinx population, um, it's important that their voices are heard. And I think that aside from the league, I don't know too many groups that are out there uh, providing that information for the Latinx community. And certainly if I can be of assistance in any way, I would be honored to. Thank you very much, Deanna, for visiting with us today, for making a video that we're sure to uh, to use in other, uh, other venues and for visiting with us today. Thank you. I will now introduce our keynote speaker, Kelly Beadle. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, yes, thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Kelly Beadle, the impact and outreach manager of CIRCLE, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement of Tufts University. Kelly joined CIRCLE in February 2019 and manages CIRCLE's Voter Registration Research Project, 
Her role is to lead qualitative and quantitative analysis of voter registration and participation, in addition to program evaluation of the project. When I heard Kelly speak uh, about the youth vote at the State League's issues briefing in October, I thought she and Circle had important ideas to share with us about the youth vote and the need to get a larger and more diverse segment of young people involved in civic society and grow into becoming <laughs> lifelong voters. Our nation needs more voters who participate not just in presidential elections, but who know the issues and care about who is elected to state and local offices like their school board, their town council and, and county board. We need an electorate that reflects the diversity of our people. And it's always struck me as odd that young people who in the long run have the most to gain or to lose from who we elect to public office, they tend to vote at lower rates than any other age group. Kelly will help us understand what factors affect young people's engagement in civic life and participation in the electoral process and what role we can play in increasing and broadening youth participation in elections. Before joining Circle, Kelly worked on program development, running field experiments and fundraising in numerous national and state-based organizations. She began her career and has worked for over a decade in Minnesota, but she grew up in Wisconsin. And in her free time, you can find her reading academic papers on experiments to change political behavior, planning a trip to a new country, and rooting for the Green Bay Packers. So remember, if you have questions for Kelly, you can type them into the chat area of Zoom. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our distinguished guest speaker, Kelly Beadle. Kelly. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Linda. Thank you for having me and spending your time this morning thinking about how to grow future voters. Um, it's great. And a lot of the work that we've been doing at Circle really aligns with this topic. So I'm really excited to share with you some of the research. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about our uh, growing voters framework that we have been developing and what kind of research that we have that um, really feeds into this idea of growing future voters. And then we'll talk a little bit about voter turnout and how to think about empowering and engaging young people in 2022. Are you seeing my notes slide or are you seeing? Okay, I'm going to swap my screens. Okay, you see in the We were oh. not seeing your note slides. I'm sorry, I said, <laughs> okay. I said that right. What you had before was perfect. Okay, great. No. All right, so before I jump in, I'll tell you a little bit about um, Circle. We are a research institute that is celebrating last year, our 20 year anniversary um, as experts in on youth civic participation. We are based at Tufts University, which is in um, Boston. And what we try to do when we think about civic youth civic participation, we've talked a lot about voting, excellent videos about um, the importance of voting, um, but we also want to connect that back to the institutions that are going to help inform and create um, future young voters. So this is the growing voters framework that we have developed. And so I'm gonna to just touch on each of these topics individually and highlight some of the research that we have um, and potentially some resources for you all as you're thinking about your work for the upcoming year. So um, first of all, thinking about voting laws. So as Linda mentioned, young people do tend to vote at lower rates than older uh, voters. There's a couple reasons for this. Number one, um, they are often voting for the first time. And I'll talk about a specific example in Virginia from this last election that shows that. So they don't necessarily know where to go, have the same kind of patterns, right? The second thing is young people move a lot. Um, you know, I know that I moved almost every year throughout my 20s and needing to update the registration each time makes it a challenge. So that's where voting laws and changing policies can be really impactful at increasing youth participation. Um, we have found through our research that um, a number of the policies that were proposed in the federal voting rights legislation, HR1, we found that states that have already adopted a lot of those policies tend to see more young people 
uh, who are participating. Um, so we've looked at specific facets of these policies as well and found that um, automatic voter registration, online voter registration, same day registration where you can register on election day, and the pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds who can register and then will be added to the rolls when they turn 18, all can have a good amp impact on young people participating. I know that Wisconsin has some of these policies, but not others. So thinking about what are some ways that you can really institutionalize um, and kind of codify and make it easier for young people um, to participate. Another element of our uh, Growing Voters framework is youth-centered election administration. When young people walk into a polling place, um, it is, they often don't see people who look like them. And so this is what we have found with some of our community-based partners. Um, the idea surfaced that, you know, it would be having young people involved in the process of actually administering elections could be very helpful and impactful activity for young people. We have been partnering with Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis um, in their student election judge program where they recruit high school and college students to serve as election judges. Um, this is helpful for the city because it fills some of the staffing needs needing to recruit hundreds or thousands of judges each election um, to serve in those polling places. It was especially helpful in 2020, um, wanting to make sure that they could run um, elections safely and having younger people be able to fill that role was really critical for them. For young people themselves, um, we have done some surveys of the student election judges and have found that this gives them a firsthand um, look at how elections are actually run. And so when you think about what Deanna was saying about being really that liaison to other people, having folks who really kind of understand the process is really critical um, to make sure that young people do have the information from people that they know um, from class or um, from their other activities. <laughs> and then um, lastly, we have also done some analysis that found that voter turnout may be higher when youth election judges are, um, are in place. So it's just kind of a win-win-win situation thinking about how to, you know, not uh, have them in the pipeline, but also having them in the actual voting booths and helping to run elections. Another pillar of the growing uh, future voters is a very large one is, is around civic education. Um, I We have many wonderful colleagues at Circle who are experts in K-12 civic education who partner with school districts and states to develop civic education curriculum and evaluate it. I am not one of those staff people, so this is not my area of expertise, but I do want to highlight that we have been involved in many um, efforts, including Educating for American Democracy, which came out last year, really a laying out a roadmap for how to uh, improve civic education in our country. Um, our executive director, Kay Kawashima Ginsburg, was one of the uh, main contributors to that report. So that is a resource that can be used for both educators and folks in the classroom, um, but also members of the community to um, uh, really tackle the issue of civics education. Part of the motivation behind this is that civic education is um, funded at much lower levels than other subject areas. And we see also in test scores that we are not um, seeing increases in test scores in civics um, over the long term. So really feeling like, especially in this moment, um, thinking about how to have folks um, have better education in the classrooms will better prepare them to be civic actors when they are of voting age. This is just a little bit more detail about what is included in that Educating for American Democracy framework, which you can probably Google or find on our website, um, but has a number of subject areas, not just voting, um, but thinking about broader themes around um, society and participation. Uh, Another pillar is uh, lifting youth voices. So as many of the young people talked about, um, 
you know, th those are great examples of young people talking about their own personal experience and how important it is to other folks that they are connected to and other folks in their community. So we believe that in order for young people to become more active, they need to hear from their peers. And one way to do that is through social and digital media. Of course, young people are online at very high rates. And when we think about participation of youth of color, which um, as one of the young people highlighted is a kind of growing segment of our population, um, we also find that the digital and social media it, um, is more used by youth of color. So an important tool for equity and participation. We also believe that there is a lot of information and it's hard to cut through all of that. Um, and seeing information from a peer is a really important way to do that. Um, as folks are bombarded with all kinds of communication and potentially misinformation. Um, another way to lift youth voices is providing opportunities for leadership that are, so not simply voting, but ways that they can lead in their communities. We have seen unprecedented youth activism over the last few election cycles um, coming off of the, on the heels of you know, tragic events that have occurred uh, around the country. So we are seeing that young people are able to be leaders and bring their peers into the fold um, in a number of different ways and providing avenues to do that that are not simply happening on one or two days a year, but are more ongoing in ways to uh, express their voice is really critical. So that is kind of our overall growing voters framework. Of course, what many folks have talked about and an important way to, to measure whether or not these are growing future voters is by youth turnout. Um, and we do have really good data and information about how young people are participating. So this graphic here um, shows you the historical trends of young people's participation since the passage of the 26th Amendment when 18 to 20 year olds were given um, the right to vote. So you can see that um, the 2018 election in particular, a midterm election had record high youth turnout. 2020 was also um, saw very high levels of youth participation, um, but it was also comparable to some other previous years. So we have more young people than ever who have been getting out and having that first experience at the polling place. And um, that's a great indication for the work ahead and continuing that. We've done analysis of a um, state by state also to see what voter turnout looks like in all the different states. And of course it is different everywhere depending on voting laws, as I mentioned. Um, we saw that, for example, states that send ballots to every voter, every registered voter, saw some of the highest civic participation in 2020. Um, when you get the ballot at your house and you simply have to return it, um, it eliminates barriers, means people don't have to find out where the polling place is, for example. Um, so, the, But the turnout did really vary across the country uh, based on other kind of contexts as well. My state of Minnesota has routinely had very high voter turnout and very high youth voter turnout. So Wisconsin is not colored in here. Um, we don't have really good information about age on the Wisconsin voter database that we conduct our analysis on. But what I can tell you is that Wisconsin in general also has very high turnout. So we can make assumptions that um, youth turnout is also comparable to some of these higher turnout states, Colorado, Maine, um, and Oregon. So. Sorry, I can't share more specific Wisconsin information for you. So thinking ahead to this upcoming year, um, we heard from Deanna, who is a college student. Um, so reaching folks on campuses is a great way to engage young people. Um, they're in one place and, and you can find folks in the classroom on a college campus where folks are hanging out. Um, but we also want to remember that college students um, only represent a share of 18 to 22 year olds. So about 55% of 18 to 22 year olds are not enrolled in 
schools are going to be working, raising families and doing other things. Um, so it's important when thinking about how to um, dedicate your programming and resources that there are, are going to be chunks of folks who are off campus that may be harder to reach that might not be um, as engaged as the folks that are on campus. And the number of college students is slowly declining since a high um, in the, around 2010. Uh, so we still have large amounts of students, you know, on young people on campus, um, but that is, um, you know, just one avenue. Another consideration for 2022 is that um, many people will be voting for the first time. So we looked at Virginia, which had an election just in um, last year in 2021, and we found that 12% um, of the young people who voted in that election were voting for the very first time. So just because someone is not already registered or does not um, have a voting history does not mean that you know, those young people should not be engaged and brought into the electorate. So that's an important strategy that may, you know, when we look at the whole population, a much, much smaller share are going to be engaged for the first time um, in these off year elections. And, um, but that's not the case for young people. And over 58% um, of the young people who voted only have voted in you know, one of the last three elections for the first time. So again, making sure that folks, if they're moving, can update their registration. If they're moving, thinking about how to provide information about where to go vote, because um, that may have changed as many people are going to have moved between 2020 and 2022. So that's a really critical element of um, engaging youth. And kind of putting it all together here, um, there are a lot of factors and influences in young people's lives, you know, from their family lives to their friend networks to potentially school or workplaces, and then focusing on folks who are cultural leaders or influencers in their lives. So this provides a lot of opportunities and a lot of avenues to engage young people. So thinking about, again, where do you wanna put your efforts? Um, there are many opportunities and inroads there and it is more complex potentially um, than folks who are not at such a transitional point in their lives. So I'm leaving you with just a few kind of thoughts and questions. So thinking about, again, electoral engagement, just coming back to some of these previous points, um, thinking about finding folks not on college campuses and finding folks who, um, you know, at Circle, we work through all of our lenses through, a, a, all of our work is through a lens of equity. So thinking about how can we make the electorate more equitable and make sure that youth of color are also being, um, are participating at equal rates to other, all youth. So thinking about those unique populations and what will be effective strategies to engage them um, in that that might not be just one thing. It might not just be door knocking or might not just be, you know, um, going to a college campus, but thinking about how can young people really be the ones carrying the message to their peers and really be the spokespeople um, so that we can have really effective messengers. Um, and then thinking longer term, of course, Lee has, as we mentioned many times here, over 100 year history and thinking about the partnerships that might most effectively reach young people, whether that's at the high school level and registering people in schools who are turning 18 years old or other types of programs that might be reaching young people in communities, whether that's job training, training programs, other types of leadership opportunities that might be a great avenue um, to kind of really meet uh, youth where they're at. And then the last two, thinking about civic education and how to support civic educators. And we have many members, uh, candidates running for school board here today. So that's certainly a very powerful way, um, but other ways we can support folks in the classroom. And then lastly, you know, what laws can we change at a state level um, that might make it easier for young people to participate and engage. So there is my contact information in our Twitter. So if you want to follow us on social media, 
I'll turn it back to Linda. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, I would really appreciate your uh, your suggestions and advice and the information that you've provided us. Terrific. Now, remember, if you have questions for Kelly, you can type them into the chat area, uh, and Kelly will answer questions after we hear from our next speaker, Lori Stotler. Uh, both Lori and Kelly will be uh, able to answer your questions. When the committee planned this event, uh, in the fall, we knew that we would like to have someone provide a local perspective on the theme of youth voting. And we couldn't think of a better person to do this than uh, Lori Stotler. Lori is a Janesville resident and has been the uh, city clerk for uh, city clerk treasurer for the city of Janesville for about six months after having served in that same capacity in Beloit for six years. Prior to that, Lori served as the elected position of Rock County Clerk from 2007 to 2015. 2022 will be Lori's 15th year of election administration and the April 5th, 2022 election will be her 48th. Lori believes that part of her role as a clerk treasurer is to assist in educating voters on the voting process and the importance of their vote. She is constantly seeking new and improved ways to encourage turnout, especially in local elections. Lori hopes that all elective officials will reach out and work in the April election before they vote on any further election legislation at the Capitol. She welcomes all Janesville residents to Janesville City Hall for public testing of election equipment before every election and to an upcoming electronic poll book open house opportunity on March 10th and March 12th. She also hopes that today you'll be inspired to become an election inspector yourself. I would like to add that we are proud to be able to claim Lori as a member of the League of Women Voters of Janesville. So please join me in welcoming Lori Stotler. Lori? Thank you, Lynn, and thank you for um, allowing me my shameless plug of trying to recruit um, poll workers into elections, not just young, but uh, I'll take any age. So thank you for allowing me to kind of share my experience over the last 15 years. Um, and I want to, you know, as, as Kelly was speaking, there was an unsung hero that popped into my mind, and he's a teacher um, in Beloit, and his name is uh, James Hoey, and he has been um, a real help in the clerk's office in helping me administer the paperwork required to be able to give, uh, to get students to be able to work in the polling place. And I'm really grateful that we have teachers that are willing to kind of be the intermediary um, because there is paperwork required for student workers. And I'll touch on that in, a, in just a minute. But, um, you know, I think it's important that we all understand that youth engagement is a process and it doesn't just happen on your 18th birthday. Um, it's both nature and nurture, and I think in a lot of ways it's more nurture. Um, and the solution to growing future voters, the process, it starts at home around the age of 10 when you're doing you know, home activities that demonstrate how voting works and, and how a, you know, a, a democracy uh, in our government works with majority um, rule. And parents who vote will create children who grow up to vote. I mean, that I see it constantly with the young people that are becoming adults and coming in. I see um, very regular voters there. I think it's really important to take your children to the polls, especially when they become teens. That's usually when they don't wanna come with you, but it's, it's the best time that they have that experience because you're really giving them that behind the wheel experience for voting. Um, make the voting process a normal activity uh, in basic decision making. And so, you know, try to demonstrate the outcome of what voting looks like. And I think with youth today, your biggest outcome is going to be in a peer to peer environment. So, whenever you can do a peer to peer environment, um, you know, if you're going to do a voter engagement at the schools, try to get a young person at your side that's going to give you street cred, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, because the peer-to-peer -peer option is, is a great uh, way to go. Uh, we do have student election official programs for students to work the polls. 
And just like James Hoey, maybe you want to try to help be the intermediary for um, paperwork in that matter to make sure that we get the signature of the principal and the parents and that the, ch the child, the, the youth gets um, freed up from their activities to be able to help at the polls. By helping at the polls and empowering them at the polls, then that automatically brings them into the process. Um, in this political environment that we're living in, I think in order to engage future voters, we also have to model positive political behavior, you know, talking about civil discourse and practicing having conversations that are uncomfortable. And, um, you know, freedom in debate is re in making sure they have that, that environment that they can start to have those conversations. Helping them to find, especially in local elections, um, but also in federal elections, because we don't want people voting just on what they see on TV, right? You want them to actually be able to have um, facts and evidence to be able to choose who they're voting for. So helping young people to find that path to, um, you know, the, when they place their pen on a ballot to have, you know, educated choices. Uh, I've always opened up my office um, when at the county clerks and at the city clerk, um, right down to offering to um, let the schools use our voting equipment to hold like city council elections so that they can get used to, um, you know, seeing the equipment and uh, filling out a, an official ballot. Um, Lisa at the county uh, has, has offered that as well. So um, let's see, what are some of my other I'm excited to hear that the uh, charter school has already booked with us to come and tour a polling place on April 5th. So uh, classroom field trips to the polls, um, especially in high school would be um, a good way to uh, bring us some more young voters. And then there's things that, uh, you know, we, we think about how bad COVID has been, but one thing that COVID did gift us was the ability to bring people into the classroom via live stream. So even though Kelly's in Minnesota, we could bring her into a classroom to help um, allow for a plethora of, of individuals like league members, clerks, election commission representatives, chief inspectors. It would be great to have people that work in the field come and talk to kids um, as they're starting to enter uh, the election field to talk to them about that, really connect them to the resources. And then, um, you know, I, I kids are not afraid of technology and we're going to be starting these Badger books. And one of my pipe dreams and hopefully I can make it happen is I would love to give youth a leadership role in these Badger books. And if I could get uh, high school seniors or even people from uh, UW Whitewater at Rock County to be my technology technicians and manage some of those things on election day, I think the young and the old would really pair well together on that. And you know, if they have a leadership role at the polls, they'll continue to come back. Um, Selfies are still cool. So young people love taking selfies on election day and posting them. So this is one of those peer to peer examples of engaging young people and having um, a polling place that provides a great backdrop. So uh, a few years ago, uh, Beloit had bought some selfie stands to put up in the polling place just before COVID where, you know, after a young person votes for the first time, they can take a picture behind that. They're not bothering anybody, but then that that social media kind of starts a stir and it's just another example of, um, of, of that peer-to-peer -peer option. TikTok voter education programs. I mean, we just have to stay current with some of the, the things that they're using and, and jump in on that end. Um, I guess to wrap up, I'd say myvote.wi.gov has made registering to vote, finding your polling place and seeing or requesting your ballot so much easier than we ever had it when we were entering um, into uh, voting mode as a young adult. So even when you're holding registration drives, I would encourage all league members to use tech, the technology route of my vote um, via tablets or computers over the paper route. Um, as you know, paper, it generally deters young people. It looks like a homework assignment more than it does something that they're excited to do. So. Uh, keep that technology coming. And while today's discussion is about growing future voters that engage young people, these ideas today can be deployed in overall in general to improve voter turnout and engagement for our entire community. And uh, recapturing voters at any age is a win for a balanced democracy. So 
Um, I love the, the data. I think the data that Kelly has shared today is pretty representative of uh, our community and our turnout. And I love that the league is, is constantly stepping foot in and trying to uh, get onto campuses and into schools. So um, it makes me proud to be a member, but uh, more proud to be your clerk. Thank you very much, Lori. At, at this time, Kelly Beadle and Lori Stotler will answer questions from the audience that you have entered into the chat. Uh, Lisa Johnson and Sue Scott have been monitoring the chat and they'll direct the questions to our speakers. Lori and Sue? Lori and Sue, I don't know if you're speaking, but if you are, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, Lori, are you considering adding security for polling places? Well, I'm not. I'm not sure what you um, what what the question as far as security is, but um, I would I would not likely have um, uniformed uh, people in the polling place uh, in order to make sure that uh, the environment is open and friendly. But uh, we have had discussion of of having. Um, officers in plain clothes. Um, we always uh, have, it is the uh, county sheriff's responsibility to maintain order on election day. So we always have uh, sheriff deputies patrolling near our polling places and our, our police department often also has enhanced uh, patrol that while we may not know that they're in our neighborhood and right close, uh, we do have um, in general, and I realize that we are in an amped up environment and um, that, you know, we, we need to make sure that all of our election workers stay safe, but um, we are constantly looking at our security plan. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lori. There's another question for you. Um, can students earn community service hours for working at the polls? Like, I think it would depend upon what the, the community service hours requirements are, but uh, in general, you can earn credit through your uh, civics class. And there's a form and um, it's, it's just a simple, it's a Wisconsin Election Commission form. And for league members who are um, comfortable going out to the site, it's, it's form number EL129. And it's the authorization to serve as an election inspector. Any hours that, uh, students are working, they can be given credit by using that form and um, having the clerk sign off that they worked. So I guess it depends, you know, that would be up to the administrator of whatever program they're speaking about, but we would happily offer those hours for credit. Great. Thank you, Lori. Uh, question for Kelly. Is the auto enrollment process feasible for voter registration? So automatic voter registration is um, historically referred to as motor voter. Um, many states already offer some version of this where when you go to the DMV and get your driver's license, there's often like a checkbox that you have to check to become a registered voter. What automatic voter registration does is instead of checking your box to become registered, it makes it just part of the process of getting your in-state driver's license. So in Oregon was really the first state to pass this in 2016. And then um, I think there's now 18 states that offer some version of kind of what we call, you know, opt in automatic voter registration. So I don't know exactly what Paul's question refers to in terms of feasibility. Um, I will say that our analysis shows that, you know, going back to kind of the early studies on Oregon, that this is a really effective way to register more folks, especially folks in rural areas from the Latino community and young people get added to the roles at higher rates using processes like this. It does, it's not a perfect solution for young people because, for example, you may have people coming in um, from out of state and might maintain a driver's license in another state. So it's not 
a silver bullet solution. Voter registration still needs to happen on top of it, um, but it is a really great way to capture a lot of folks um, doing another government service they're already doing. Some other states also use, you know, other people will register through other agencies other than the DMV. Um, so whether that will be receiving social services or even um, military agencies, but uh, the DMV is the primary one. Yeah. I see um, <clears throat> there's a question that uh, you addressed in the chat, but I didn't know if you'd like to elaborate on uh, this one. Do you have any examples of outreach to non-student youth? So I included a couple examples. We have partnered with an organization called Opportunities Youth United, and I was looking for a good write-up of this on our website and couldn't find anything, um, but it is a network of uh, nonprofits in different communities around the country that are working with youth, and in some cases they're working on um, particular issues like increasing the minimum wage or job training programs. So thinking about nonprofits that are reaching um, young people or places where young people are kind of coming together to work on civic type of projects, even if it's not voting, um, is a one really good um, place. And then some of the work in rural areas in particular, which just are harder because there are people are more far flung, they're not as many congregating points. Um, I've included a post here from um, the Rural Assembly that had found some success working, <clears throat> excuse me, on, with social media and digital media, as I talked about before, as one avenue to, you know, essentially find youth who are active who can reach others in their networks. And of course, high schools, you know, that's a huge one. And I know the league has historically done a lot of work with high schools. Okay, great. Thank you, Kelly. Are there any more questions? If there are more questions, you can post them in the chat. Well, I don't know if any more questions are coming in. Oh, here's, here's one for Lori. Here's one for Lori. What is the current method of informing youth voters on local elections? I'm not sure if the person asking the question could uh, ask a, a little bit, uh, go a little bit deeper on, um, you know, whether it be youth voters or regular voters. That's always the challenge at, at the local level is going there's there's really not a lot of one place one place stops where people can go and getting them that information and of course as a as a clerk it's it's that's why we need people like the the league of women voters as a clerk it's inappropriate uh for our office to point voters towards information about candidates because we are really just the administrator of the process itself so um, that's really not um, something that I'm really prepared to, I don't, maybe there's a league member that knows more than I do because it's not something that we would do on our end. Okay, thank you. I, I have another question for Kelly. Um, let's see. Can Kelly say a little more about involving young rural voters? If I could just make one comment on the previous question about informing young voters too. When young people are registered, they're also going to get outreach, not only from potentially a city or county clerk saying, this is your, you know, in Minnesota, we get these blue cards, right? These blue postcards that every time tells you where your polling place is. So that's a really important way for them to get information, totally nonpartisan. But then of course, once people are registered to vote, then, other organizations can contact them, they're on voting rolls, campaigns can get in touch with them. So that is part of the reason why getting young people on the voting rolls is important too, so that it's kind of, now folks know that they're there and we'll also be able to contact them in multiple ways um, other than them hearing from their peers. So um, 
Okay, so going to the question about involving young rural voters. Again, I don't think, I don't know that there's a one size fits all solution here. I mean, I would say we've talked a lot about the importance of teachers and the importance of young people who are leaders within their community, whether that be a high school or a college campus. So I would say the best approach is going to be identifying those folks and figuring out where are gathering places, where are nonprofits that are serving youth and kind of starting the process with more of a community map, right? So I would think about like my hometown, Wisconsin Rapids, um, thinking about, you know, maybe talking to the mayor who's actually kind of a young guy himself um, and thinking about, you know, are there social studies teachers that we have relationships with and thinking about kind of what is it the community that you care about and how might you get connected? Are there Facebook groups of people who are already really active? Is there a group working on like, uh, you know, LGBT equality issues on the local level? Really kind of mapping out where are the best entry points and how could you then get connected to them to inform a strategy? So it's really more, I think of kind of an organizing, 101 type of exercise than like having data and research like so many of our other topics that we have um, but that would be you know my perspective and advice great okay uh, i have a request kelly for your email address could you post that up again i think you had that during your talk Oh, very good, thank you. Okay, we have another question. Um, this looks like it's a general question. Let's see, no, I've lost it. Uh, Okay, uh, here's a board supervisor comment. As a board supervisor, I have been receiving questions from potential voters about what their new district is after the redistricting. I've had difficulty finding information about the new districts through the normal channels most people would search. What is your suggestion for locating your new district? That's a, a great question, Dave. And we, um, we in this, in this, we being the city of Janesville, um, will be doing a pretty heavy PR campaign um, with the newspapers, with radio, with social media to be getting everybody pointing them to the www.myvote.wi.gov, which is the state's my vote place. Um, the county and the cities and the towns and the villages have all updated their voting plans with the new districts in it. So when you go to my vote and you put your name and your, your date of birth in, if you're a registered voter, it's going to tell you um, who your local districts are. Uh, that being said, um, I wanna point out that the county and local uh, redistricting is complete and that data is up there. I've also posted on the city of Janesville's website um, under clerk treasurer election information, the new voting maps. Um, if you are an election inspector, that is one uh, perk that you get is you will be receiving in the mail late next week, a new um, map. And in Janesville, we were going to start doing consolidating to five polling places on primaries and 10 polling places on regular elections. And uh, there are a couple of new polling places out there because we've, we've lost a couple. So it's a great question, Dave, and, and uh, you are a little bit ahead of me, but uh, hopefully in the, in the coming three weeks as we lead up to April 5th, you will not have uh, anybody asking you that question. But you can certainly go out to um, for Janesville out to the Janesville website and see at least the Janesville piece. And, uh, you know, Lisa may uh, have more on the county itself, but my vote is current. Is Lisa Talison still with us? Maybe she I am. I am. So the other way to um, look up information is to go to my vote. 
and then scroll all the way to the bottom of the screen. There's a red line that says elected officials. Click on elected officials that asks for your address and will give you all of your districts from president down to school board. It gives you all of your districts that are current right now. They have taken off your uh, state senators, your state assembly and your congressional because those districts are not completed yet. The locals, those are done. That's why that's that information is there. Any Thanks. questions on that? Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Lori and Lisa, do you have any thoughts on the current legislation regarding voter registration? I'll yield to you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many election bills out there. Um, they had many public hearings uh, this last week on, on many different items. Um, it, it, there's a lot of things going on and the the legislature is led by one party and the governor's another. So I don't know that anything's going to change soon. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would just point out that I am, in a, I am uh, in a, an appointed uh, election official with the city of Janesville. And so it is my job to remain neutral on all legislation. I have lots of thoughts on my own, but un unfortunately in, in my role as an appointed, it's, it's appropriate for me to basically say that it is, it is my job to make sure that everybody that is eligible to vote um, can cast a ballot and do so without any barriers and ensure that their vote gets counted. Are there any other questions that anyone would like to ask? I don't know if anybody else is uh, coming up with a question, but uh, uh, perhaps we can wrap up uh, a little, little bit early. I want to thank Kelly and Lori and Deanna and uh, Lisa Tollison for also coming in and, and uh, asking, answering questions and giving us so much to think about and for challenging us to find ways to grow young voters in our community and, and uh, help all voters uh, in our communities. Uh, both the Janesville and the Beloit Leagues have received grants from the League of Women Voters Education Fund for youth voter registration projects this spring. And while we want to reach out to all potential voters, the focus of the grant is to increase our outreach to young people in our communities who are not attending four-year colleges. So those would be uh, young people who are uh, in the workplace, uh, young people who are attending uh, our two-year campuses, and those who are uh, in high school. On the Super Bowl weekend, uh, our speakers, Kelly, Lori, Deanna, have given us a locker room pep talk before the kickoff for our youth voter registration project, so we thank you. And I ask members of our audience to commit to encourage young people you know to uh, learn about our government and elections to be good examples and role models for them and to engage in the election process. If you know young people who are influencers who could encourage other young people to vote, uh, please let them know that the league would love to work with them and that we have information and resources that we can share with them for, for them to use. Our Voter Services Committee Chairs, Pat Zodi of Beloit and Lisa Johnson of Janesville need your help. Um, and so if you can volunteer some time, they will find something that you can do, whether that is working a table at a registration event or sending text messages or addressing postcards from the comfort of your and, and safety uh, from your home. Um, Although we do love, would love to have you become members of the League of Women Voters, you do not need to be a League member to help us, as long as you are willing to abide by the League's nonpartisan policies. We want to remind those of you who live in Beloit and some other Rock County communities, uh, I think of the Supervisory District Number 3 in the Edgerton area, that you have a primary election to vote on on Tuesday of this week, February 15th. Uh, both leagues are going to be conducting candidates forums in March before the spring general elections uh, that are in, held in April, and I'll be sharing a, some slides that show that. 
uh, be sure to check out uh, myvotewisconsin.gov and uh, vote411.org for unbiased voting guides. Uh, Vote411.org is a uh, publication of the League of Women Voters Education Fund, and uh, it contains uh, voting guides that have been developed by League uh, members, the Leagues of Women Voters. And you'll be able to find uh, candidate information and uh, uh, links to candidate forums uh, on that vote411.org website. Be sure to check out the League of Women Voters websites and Facebook pages for information about upcoming events. Both leagues have events coming up next week. Uh, Lisa Johnson and Sue Scott, who have been monitoring the chat, have entered the links to the websites in the chat, and they'll provide contact information for our voter services chairs. Now, if you're not familiar with how to save text, you can save the text of the chat that's been going on during this meeting um, by clicking on the three dots just above the space where you would enter your message into the chat box, and you can select Save Chat on the pop-up menu. So you'll be able to save the comments that have been made uh, and the, uh, the links that have been shared during this meeting. Susan, I'll let you have the final words. Okay, can you go ahead and put up that, that screen that's got the rolling? Yes, I will do that. On it? That way people can see it. I don't think it's in the chat right now. There's so many other thank yous going on in the chat, so we appreciate that. Um, I, I've been inspired today to get more involved. I have been involved in our league's um, voter education grant. We went at a local high school just a couple of days ago, and I was so impressed with their their enthusiasm and their it's just remarkable. They have a political club that's got like 12 people in it. It's just amazing. So um, we need to encourage all of our young people to get involved in their local government so then they could get to know how to do it locally so then they can hopefully move up and do like some of our assembly people have. And they were pretty young. Some of our assembly people are young. I think that's great. So be sure to check out our websites for upcoming events. We've got one next week that's particularly aimed at voting. It's on ranked choice voting. It's at noon on Thursday and you can find it on our website. Um, and let's see, you can just Google it at League of Women Voters Beloit and you'll find it. So that is our, and then we've got two forums coming up. Ours are both going to be, um, on Zoom, and I believe Janesville's are going to be, are they going to be in person, Linda? They're both in, ours are in March. The city council uh, forum will be in person, and the uh, school board uh, forum will be on uh, uh, just through JATV, but both both forums will be uh, broadcast and live, stream, live streamed by JATV. Okay. So anyway, with that, we want to thank everyone for joining us today in this fine tradition that brings us together with our two chapters. I still don't see the things not scrolling there, Linda. Let me let me try that. Okay. And we hope you will join us again next year when we, Beloit takes the lead on having a luncheon. We'll we'll see if we'll see what the weather brings and what the COVID uh what the COVID temperature brings. But so yes, ours are um, in uh, early March and theirs are in, um, and you can see where they are. Those are our websites. And <clears throat> of course we would love to have a donation if you could find it in your heart. And ours, uh, we've got an election coming up on Tuesday here. Our city council is the eighth and our um, school board is gonna be the 10th for us. And you can find those on our website. So with that, we really appreciate everybody coming today. And thank you so much to Kelly and to Lori and to Lisa and to Deanna. So thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you next year or at some other future event. Thank you.